Hello and welcome to Alex's Computer Lab. I am glad you could come and join me again and I am here to talk about a machine that is actually not mine. I do have it temporarily so I figured it would be a good use of time to uh, do a little overview of the machine and then install some software on it. The machine, as you can probably see here, is an IBM PS2. Particularly this is an IBM PS2 Model 70. Uh, that is IBM's first 386 based machine in the personal system 2 line. It was introduced in 1988. This particular one has a 20 MHz 386 DX processor in it. Uh, it has 6 MB of RAM in 3 2 MB 72 pin SIMs. Now there's a size you don't hear very often for a 72 pin. Um, and it has a 60 MB hard drive. Uh, the hard drive is what's called DBASD, uh, which is uh, an IBM pseudo standard. They use that it. it's a cartridge connector. It was used only in the PS2 line. I don't believe that anyone else ever used that type of disc in any other machine. So they're kind of hard to find nowadays. And uh, if they start failing, which fortunately they're pretty reliable, but when they start failing, most times people end up replacing them with SCSI discs and SCSI controllers because those are relatively available. So the IBM PS2, uh, what makes these machines different is a couple things. Uh, first of all, starting with the bus. So most PCs of this area, uh, being 386s, 286s, uh, from the late 1980s, were based on what's called the ISA, or Industry Standard Architecture Bus. That is either an 8, in the case of the IBM PC or XT or clones, or 16, in the case of the IBM AT clones, 386s and higher, bit bus, um, that comes in a uh, split connector and uh, there were a ton of cards available from display adapters and sound cards to storage devices to uh, serial and parallel interface devices and all kinds of custom interfaces. So IBM when they decided to come up with the IBM Personal System 2 line of computers did that partially because of the clone manufacturers. There's a recent TV series called Halt and Catch Fire, which portrayed a fictional account of the creation of the first IBM clone, which was the Compaq Portable PC. Uh, it was a direct clone of IBM's 5155, which was their portable PC, uh, in a portable form factor. And actually done rather well, actually, by Compaq. Uh, in a lot of ways, it is significantly superior to IBM's 5155, uh, notably accepting the keyboard. But anyway, so IBM, in responding to the clone manufacturers, decided to do a couple things. Uh, one of which is, instead of using a freely available bus design, again ISA, they decided to create their own bus and then license it out. And that bus is called Microchannel. So this machine here, the PS2 Model 70, has Microchannel bus. It has two 32-bit Microchannel slots, which is fairly impressive for 1988, and it has one 16-bit Microchannel slot. Uh, it has three 72-pin SIM slots that require 72-pin parity SIMs, um, and actually a little bit different 72-pin uh, SIMs than most other PCs use uh, that are somewhat specific to IBM, uh, having to do with, if anyone's familiar with the SPD settings on, on the SIM modules, they're slightly different from for IBM modules, even though the RAM works identically. Uh, but anyway, so this machine has three of those slots, and in it there are three 2 megabyte 72 pin SIMs, as I previously mentioned. Uh, this machine, as you can probably see, is not the cleanest machine I have. Uh, this comes out of the Vintage Computer Federation's collection from the warehouse in Wall, New Jersey. So please, if you have a chance, check out https colon slash slash vcfed.org and you can see all about the Vintage Computer Federation. So uh, we're going to power up this machine and we'll take a look at what's installed on the hard drive. Uh, which uh, I think will be somewhat unexciting, and then we're going to do something interesting with it. We are going to install OS2. So I happen to have an original copy of OS2. This happens to be, looks like disk number 5 here. Um, but I have an original copy of OS2 2.1 sitting here, and here's the rest of the installation media. And uh, I've had to replace a couple disks if you see my disks as I put them in, you'll see a couple that don't match and those discs have started to fail so I have created replacements. But in general I have original media for this process. Let's get started by turning the machine on. 
hopefully you can see them on the screen. The machine is checking memory. One of the differences between IBM PS2s and centerpieces at the time is that the memory test is not skippable. So we see the machine starting, starting up MS-DOS. It has MS-DOS 6.22 installed on it currently and Windows 3.1. So we're testing it out. Testing memory. And we are attempting to start Windows. So what's interesting here is that uh, Windows would be on this machine is not so unusual. A lot of these machines, even though they were sold by IBM, uh, would have been sold with DOS and Windows, and there is a reasonable chance that uh, this machine came with DOS, although certainly not MS-DOS 6.22, which was not out in 1988. Uh, but it might well have come with some version of DOS, likely PC-DOS. So spoiler alert, I've tried this before and I know what's going to happen. So Windows is going to fail to start up because there is some damaged data on the hard drive. Hopefully it doesn't mean the hard drive is completely dead. Yep, there we go. That's what we got before. So data is damaged on the hard drive. Uh, hopefully there are not too many bad sectors in the hard drive, but we'll find out as we install OS2. So again, let's get started and attempt to install OS2. This version of OS2 that I have is OS2 version 2.1, and again I have the original box. So we'll reboot and start installing. So OS2, for anyone who's not familiar, which I'll bet you probably are, in fact uh, Joe's Computer Lab did an excellent video on installing uh, OS2 2.0. Um, you should probably check that out. Uh, Joe does a whole bunch of really nice videos and uh, he goes into a lot of detail on the subject. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, OS2 was uh, a Microsoft and IBM collaboration initially. So it was originally uh, created to follow up on DOS, and initially Microsoft and IBM worked together and produced OS2 1.0. Um, sometime in the OS2 1 time frame, after that initial release came out, IBM and Microsoft had different ideas for where they wanted to go with the operating system. So they ended up going their separate ways, and uh, Microsoft took their part of OS2, and after a lot of reworking, ended up coming up with uh, something that's on the market in 2021, being Windows NT. So there's very little of OS2 left in that, but uh, OS2 ended up living quite a long life. It was supported by IBM through many releases, uh, the last of which the commonly known release was called OS2 Warp, uh, and that was OS2 Warp Revision 4. And that was supported up through about 2006. However, you may occasionally still see devices running OS2 in production use in 2021, because OS2 is an extremely reliable operating system, which is not too surprising given that it's an IBM product. So OS2 was in a ton of embedded systems, like ATM machines and machinery control devices and industrial control machines, and that sort of thing. So it had some presence in the home market, but it wasn't great. I did use OS2, uh, starting with OS2 2.0, 2.1, and Warp 3, uh, and I did like it, but uh, I could see the, the way the world was moving in computer software, and I moved on to using Windows on PCs. So here we go, we finished with the installation disk, we're going to switch to disk 1. Okay, so we're starting to load OS2. I'm sure I will speed up this process when I edit the video because uh, there will be a lot of disk reading. And this would be an extremely boring video if you sit here and watch me install OS2 and just uh, listen to all the disks whirl. There are 17 main installation disks for OS2, there, uh, for OS2 2.1 that is. There are two display driver disks and there are three printer disks. So, uh, that is 22 total disks. That's a lot. Uh, not so many as some other installs that I've done. I actually, uh, in the time frame of this version of OS2 in 1993, I did an installation of Linux on my home PC at the time, and uh, that was on 122 floppy disks. Uh, I'll have to talk about that in detail at some point, but let me say, if anyone who worked with uh, three and a half inch floppy disks at the time, and uh, even more so now, probably guessed that 
that was very difficult to find 122 good 3.5 inch floppy disks, even though I bought them brand new. Um, being that I was a high school student at the time, I could not buy the highest quality disks, and I had a lot of bad disks. Being there new, I could of course return them, but I didn't have the ability to download anything at my house at the time, so I actually had to go to the high school that I attended uh, and re-download every time I hit a bad disk. And that was unbelievably frustrating. It was weeks worth of work to get it finally installed. But considering that I have spent a large part of the rest of my career working on Linux, it was probably worth the effort. So we are still loading here. Um, IBM floppy drives. So since we're going to be sitting here watching them work quite a bit, uh, I'll talk a little bit about them. IBM 3.5 inch floppy drives, as represented by this drive right here, are a little bit different than most PC floppy drives in their interface. So overall they function exactly the same way. Uh, they have two read-write heads, one for each side of the disk, um, and one spindle, and there's a, the disk itself is a sheet of mylar contained in a plastic case. Um, for anyone who's just never really worked with a three and a half inch disc, you can see the disc if you move the shutter out of the way. There's the mylar, and it's impregnated with uh, magnetically active particles on the mylar. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but uh, let's get started with installing OS2 now that we're loaded at least partially. We're going to go ahead and press enter to start the installation. Um, and this particular version of OS2, as it talks about on this screen, does support DOS and Windows programs. Um, that was a significant, important part of OS2, and it was always part of the design to be able to support DOS software. And then when OS2 2.0 came out, they decided to integrate support for Windows. So there were a number of versions of OS2 you could buy. You could buy the full installation version, which is what this is, uh, or you could buy a version called OS2 for Windows that required you to already have a copy of Windows. So uh, those are the primary versions. Then, of course, um, there are upgrade options as well. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of these welcome screens. And uh, I do promise I will get video capture set up properly. I, I have good video capture for HDMI at this point, but uh, not for VGA. Uh, so I am working on that, and in future videos you will see that. So the first thing it's going to ask us is where we want to install OS2. Um, we're going to say we're going to ex uh, accept um, we're going to accept the drive that we're going to install OS2 on drive C, although actually, we're going to go to specify a different drive, and I'm going to uh, re-lay out the drive. And it's warning us that uh, if we do this, we're going to lose our data, which is fine. Okay, so uh, it is telling us that on this disk, a partition with at least 20 megabytes of space must be set installable. We have a 60 megabyte disk, of which 58 megs are usable. It shouldn't be a problem. So I'm going to select this partition, and I'm going to say delete the partition. And we're going to hit, and that gives us uh, 58 megs of free space. Now we're going to create a partition. 58 megs, a primary partition, and now we're also going to install a boot manager. Actually, uh, it looks like we can't do that. So anyway, we're going to set this installable. So we'll, set, we'll call it OS2. In fact, let us use special characters. Let's see if we can actually say OS slash 2. Yep, we can. And please forgive me, this is uh, something I have done in the past. I've worked with OS2 many times, but it has been a lot of years. Okay, so we're all done. So we're going to exit. Okay, and we're going to do uh, save and exit here. Partitioning, uh, partitioning is complete. The system must be restarted. Okay, so we have to reboot. We're going to put the installation disk back in the drive and hit enter reboot. So while this is happening, I'm going to go back to talking about floppy drives and how the IBM PS2 floppy drives are a bit different. So what IBM did is when they created the PS2, um, they took the floppy interface, which is uh, 34 pins, and they decided to integrate the power for the floppy drive into the same connector and produce a card edge connector for that. Uh, for anyone who's worked with older floppy drives, they will remember that uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drives and older three and a half inch floppy drives indeed did use a cartridge connector. 
So what IBM did is just added a couple extra pins on that cartridge connector to deliver power along with the data for the drive. Um, and that means that uh, if you just attempt to plug a standard PC uh, Shugart style floppy drive into a PS2, it will not work. You have to produce an adapter cable, but it is straightforward to do that. It's just uh, electrical wiring. But it's, it's somewhat annoying in, uh, in this day and age to have to do that because uh, a lot of IBM floppy drives have suffered from the capacitor plague. Um, so if uh, you get an IBM PS2 nowadays that has not had its floppy drive, had the capacitors replaced on it, probably going to have issues. And we'll in fact see with this drive. I, this drive seems to be working in my testing so far, but we will find out. Okay, I'm going to switch the installation disk to disk number one. And there we go. We're now continuing on disk number one. It will take a minute to load. Um, let's see, other differences with these machines. So, one of the other interesting things about IBM PS2s is that they were significantly easier to work on than a lot of PC clones at the time. This particular machine, in fact, and uh, I might do a teardown at some point, but uh, it does not require a whole bunch of tools to work on it. Um, there are thumb screws that hold the case on, so you can just remove them, assuming uh, somebody has not helped you by putting in the screws so tightly that you can't remove them with your fingers, which did often happen. Um, but uh, you can take most of this machine apart with no tools at all. So you can remove the thumb screws to pull the case off. And then once you do that, um, this floppy drive and then the hard drive, which is back here underneath this LCD monitor I have sitting on it, uh, it actually, they're cartridge connectors and they both slide in directly to their connectors with no tools required. Um, there's little plastic clips that hold them in place and if you push those clips down, um, you can pull the hard drive and the floppy drive out. It's a nice design. Uh, and the, fl the plastic, in comparison to a lot of vintage hardware, has actually stood up pretty well, which is fairly impressive. Um, there's actually a mid-plane inside this case, about halfway up, right about here. And uh, that mid-plane is attached to the bottom of the case, actually with uh, plastic rivets. There's a little tool that sits right here on the motherboard, and that little tool will pop up those plastic rivets, because they are meant to be reused. So, it's an interesting design. It's a little alarming the first time you use it because they make quite a snapping noise when you go to pull them out. So, of course, the first thing you think is that, oops, I broke it. But that's the way it's supposed to work, so uh, it still works in 2021. So it's not something good about the quality of the engineering. Although, quite honestly, I probably would have been a little different. I would have used some more thumb screws inside to hold that down. But, again, PS2s are pretty nice to work on. Uh, it is much more difficult to find microchannel cards for PS2s, especially for things like sound cards, than it is to find their equivalent ISA cards, so that is a negative. We are starting to see some homebrew development of microchannel cards. Uh, in fact, recently uh, a microchannel sound card was just released, um, which is called the Sm Snark Barker MCA, which is a clone of the Sound Blaster MCA. Um, they were, those were sold back in the day, both the Sound Blaster and the Pro Audio Spectrum had microchannel versions, uh, but not a ton were sold, and correspondingly, uh, they sell for a lot of money nowadays, and they're pretty rare. Okay, so we're back into OS2, and we're going to hit Enter to continue, hit Enter to continue again, and Enter to continue again. And this version of OS2 is theoretically the upgrade edition, so it may want me to prove that I have an existing version of DOS. So we'll see how that goes. Okay, so we've picked that partition that we created in the last installation, and now it wants to get number two. So, so far, so good on the floppy drive. We hope our luck will continue. Loading system files, please wait. Now, I suppose I don't really have a choice in the matter. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about. One of the innovations with IBM OS2 2.0 is what you see here, the high-performance file system. Uh, for anyone who's familiar with IBM PC DOS and Windows all the way up through Windows 3.11 knows that the file system in use was what's called the file allocation table or FAT file system. Uh, OS2 does support that, as you can see right here but it also supports the high-performance file system, which is a significantly faster file system um, that includes a lot of advanced functionality, including larger disk support, um, some redundancy capabilities, 
uh, and things like long file names, you know, amazing for DOS in uh, 1980s. But uh, we're going to go with that on this machine. Uh, as an interesting note, uh, Microsoft Windows NT is able to read uh, HPFS or the High Performance File System through at least uh, Windows NT version 351. I don't remember whether Windows NT 4 supported it as well, but I think it did. Okay, it is now formatting our installation partition. I'm not sure if you can see our drive LED. It's a little dim, but it is flickering here. Hard drive is actually fairly quiet, which means it's in fairly good condition for its age. Uh, it's not a real big drive at 60 megabytes, but uh, again, when this machine was sold, the 60 meg drive was very large. Uh, in 1988, I didn't have a PC at all, um, but it did have a Macintosh. I had a Macintosh SE that came with a 40 megabyte SCSI hard drive, and that was a very expensive purchase that my parents had made. So I'm not sure exactly how long this will take to format, so again, likely I will fast forward this part of the video.